All right, good evening, everyone. We thank God for another opportunity to gather together uh, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank God for all of those who are here with us inside the actual sanctuary, for each and every one of you who are watching with us in our e-campuses, for those who will be watching our rebroadcast. We thank God for you, 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 and for you. Do me a quick favor for those of you who are watching online and even for those who are in the house, wherever you are, Make sure you're sharing this broadcast, letting folk know that we are live as we seek to conclude this series that we are in, This Means War. If you're watching us on Facebook, make sure that you have liked our church Facebook page. If you are with us on YouTube, make sure you have subscribed um, to our YouTube page. That way you can stay up to date with all the things that are going on uh, here in Zion. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. As we begin tonight's Bible study, our Father and our God, we thank you for this Wednesday night Bible study. God, we thank you that we get to come together to worship you, God, to study your word, to go deeper and to grow deeper in you. Now, God, it is our prayer that you push aside each and every one of us, that you will decrease each and every one of us as you help each and every one of us to push aside everything and everyone that would seek to subtract, distract, and detract from this moment that we get to have with you, decrease me personally, increase the Holy Ghost, that all of us might be strengthened, encouraged, sharpened, strengthened by your word. We honor you, God, we praise you. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen and amen. So on tonight, we're going to finish our series, This Means War. And on last week, I gave you a series of scriptures to write down, to study on your own. On last week, we ended uh, in Psalms 84. And on tonight, we're going to begin in one of my favorite scriptures, Psalms 91. For the last month or so, we've been talking about a spiritual warfare and how to uh, engage and win uh, the battle that takes place in the spiritual realm. Uh, just recently, this past week, I, some of you may have seen on Facebook, my youngest sister let my family and I know about what's going on. Apparently, there is something going around on Facebook uh, regarding Beyonce at the BET Awards and how uh, in the midst of her performance, allegedly, and I say that emphasis on the word allegedly, there was a quick second transformation uh, from her face to what appeared to have been a demonic face. Uh, and so that's going all around on Facebook. Folk are uh, mesmerized by the fact that uh, in the midst of her performance, this image, what some are claiming to have been Sasha Fierce, based upon a previous interview that she gave about how when she performs, this other entity takes over her, uh, surfaced in the midst of her performance. Not getting into whether or not that was true or false, uh, I think that it solidifies, especially in this series that we are in and have been in, the importance of understanding and knowing that the spiritual realm is real. Amen? That just as God is real, Satan is real. Just as the angels are real, demons are real. And as we have been studying over the last month and a half, because we are the children of the Most High God, we have nothing to fear uh, when it comes to the kingdom of darkness, amen? And so we've been talking about, the, first and foremost, the origins when it comes to spiritual warfare, how Satan was once an, once an angel of light and how uh, Satan became envious of God and wanted God's uh, position and wanted God's power and as a result, attempted to overthrow God and how God removed or at least uh, had Michael remove Satan and one third of the angels from heaven. Uh, that decided to follow Satan and how Satan, because he envied God and wanted to take God's place, lost his position uh, because he desired that which he could not have. And he found himself out of the presence of God, found himself out of the will of God, uh, found himself in evil and in sin, forever outside of the love and embrace of God. And how we saw in Genesis chapter 3, uh, Satan then tempted Eve. Uh, with that same desire of wanting that which she should not have. God told Eve, told Adam, uh, you can have everything in the garden except for the tree, that which comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the moment that you eat of it, you shall surely what? 
die. Y'all heard me say it. But when Satan, through the serpent, spoke to the woman, said to the woman, no, you won't die. God knows that the moment that you eat from that fruit, you'll be what? Like him. There, again, that desire, wanting that which was not hers, that which belonged to God, wanting to be like God, and as a result, putting her will above God's. And as a result, she ate the fruit, gave it to her husband, and they both fell. Right? And so we've been talking about the origins of spiritual warfare and how we come into conflict or how sin came into the world because of man's decision not to obey God. And that, as a result, creates conflict between our nature, we're, we're born in sin, shaped in iniquity, the will of Satan, and the will of God for our lives. And we who are born again are to always submit our will, our desire, to the will of who? God's, right? And the whole goal of Satan is to get us outside of God's will, to get us to operate in, his, in our own will, because if we're operating in our will and not in God's will, we ultimately are operating in Satan's will. So we talked about how uh, Satan, how he attacks us. We talked about how he attacks directly. He'll come himself. Or he might send demonic uh, forces or spirits to bother us, to cause doubt to be planted in our spirit, whatever it may be. And then we talked about the indirect, covert ways in which he may attack, using individuals, uh, using uh, situations, etc., to cause us to come outside of God's will. And we spent a significant time point, amount of time in this series dealing with the direct and indirect attacks of Satan. And then the latter half of this series, that which we're in now, we've been talking about how to fight uh, the devil, how to resist Satan, how to resist uh, the attacks of the enemy. And we started by saying, First and foremost, we can take confidence in what God says, that we already have what the victory. And because we already have victory, there's no tool or weapon that Satan can use against us that will be successful. Why? Because the blood of Jesus has already made him a defeated foe, right? And so if we come from that knowledge, from that way of thinking, from that framework, there's nothing that Satan can do or say that will cause us to step out of God's will because we already know we have what? The victory. Right? And so on last week, we, we studied and we went through several scriptures I gave on last week, told you to study them on your own. And on tonight, I want us to go to Psalms 91, one of my favorite uh, passages of scripture and one that is important uh, in our fight and in our resistance against the devil and the forces of darkness. Psalms 91, go there if you can. Psalms 91, and as always, I'll be coming from the New King James Version. But you can look at and reference whichever translation makes the most sense to you. We're going to try to missile through this on tonight so we can close the series. Psalms 91, do we have it in the house or do y'all need more time? We have it online. Let's look at it together. Psalms 91 reads like this. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. Here's that word again that Donnie looked up a few weeks ago. He's my what? Fortress. My God in him will I trust. So David, before he goes anywhere... In Psalms 91, he reaffirms in himself and to God. He reaffirms in the writing and the crafting of Psalms 91 that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High abides in his shadow. That God is my refuge. He's my place of safety. He's my place of comfort. He's the place I can go to for protection. He's my fortress. He's my strong tower. He is the place where I can go to where it doesn't matter how hard the enemy attacks. Because I'm in God's embrace, I am what? Safe. Right? So David acknowledges before he says anything else that my safe place, that my place of comfort, that my place of refuge 
It's not in my parents. It's not in my own knowledge. It's not in my intellect. It's not in my 401k. It's not in how well I think I uh, can quote the scripture. But my uh, refuge is in God himself. And because my refuge is in God himself, I will trust. Right? And so the key to winning any spiritual battle that we're in, I've said it before, I'll say it again, is trusting in our refuge. It's trusting in our fortress. It's trusting in the God that we serve. It doesn't matter how it looks. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what you're suffering with. It doesn't matter how your house has been attacked. It doesn't matter whether you lost your job. It doesn't matter if your body's been afflicted. It doesn't matter what a form of attack you may be dealing with, whether it's in the spiritual realm or whether Satan is moving and working through people and obstacles and situations on the physical realm, whatever it is that may seem to have surrounded you, you can trust in the one who is your refuge. Amen? And so David gets that out there. He makes it clear that God is my refuge. And I will trust him. Surely, because I trust him, because he's my refuge, surely he's going to do something. And what is he going to do? He's going to deliver me. He's going to deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the newsome pestilence. He's going to deliver you from the traps that are meant to trap the fowler. He's going to deliver you from those perilous or noisome pestilences. Whatever may come that tries to trap you and whatever pestilence that comes to try to afflict you, David says, because God is my refuge and I trust him, I know beyond a doubt that he will deliver me. And that's the thing that we all struggle with, Sister Joyce. Uh, Sister uh, Janice, I said, saw you and I said Joyce for some reason, so God, wherever she is, cover up. That's the thing that we struggle with. I, I know what he said, but it's hard to trust when I'm under attack. I know what he said, but it's hard to trust when my back's against the wall and it feels like Satan is closing in. But I heard this one preacher say, my mom was, and I were talking about it yesterday. He said something that went along the lines like this, that God does his best work. When you feel like you're all by yourself, God does your best, his best work when you feel like you're all by yourself. I was talking to one of my uncles, uh, uh, Pastor Thurm James, he was quoting a senior uh, preacher who's now gone on to be with the Lord. He said that this senior preacher, I believe it was Augustus Jones, Dr. Augustus Jones, he said that he said something like this. He said, God sits, this God the Son sits on the right hand uh, of the Father. But he does his best work on the left hand. He said that while I was in his house on last weekend, and he, he made sure to repeat, he said, son, I, I want you to remember what this pastor said. He said in his sermon that the son of God sits on the right hand of the father, but he does his best work, what? On the left. He does his best work on the side that you least expect him to. He does his best work on the side where the enemy thinks God can't uh, make a change or do anything or that God is not going. He does his best work in the area that you least expect it. And it's in those places where it feels like all hope is lost. It's in those places where it feels like uh, you are all by yourself. It's in those places where you just don't know how you're going to make it. It's in those places where you have to trust God all the more. Because David instructs us and says, because he is our refuge and our fortress, we must trust him. And if we trust him, he surely will deliver. You ought to underline that in your Bible, write it down in your book. If I trust him, he will deliver me. No matter what it is that has come across your desk, doesn't matter what it is that you're dealing with, it doesn't matter what it is you're facing, he will deliver you. Just understand that he may not deliver you how you want him to deliver you, but he will deliver you. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth 
shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrows that flyeth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth or layeth waste in the noonday. Let's stop there for a moment. David says that the truth of God is my shield and my buckler. So God's word that we know is true will protect me and what cover me. Y'all with me? This is why knowing your word is important. This is why we have to take time to study our Bible, not just in Bible study, but on our own individual times. Because when Satan comes and tries to attack us in our spirit, tries to attack us with situations, tries to attack us in our relationships or whatever those attacks may be, you can go back to the word of God, which we know is what? True. And David tells us it is our shield. Well, last week, we learned that it's our shield and our son. We learned from Ephesians 6 how it is the shield of faith. Our faith uh, is our shield and our faith is built upon the word of God. Are y'all with me? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. So the word is important in us not only being able to go on the offensive spiritually, but also on the defense. Because we have his word, because we trust him, it doesn't matter what comes in the nighttime that seeks to terrorize us. It doesn't matter what tries to attack us in the day. It doesn't matter what form of destruction that tries uh, to lay in wait for us. David tells us we have the assurance that God is with us, covering us with his wings. Are y'all with me? A thousand shall fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look or behold and see the reward of the wicked. David says, that a thousand may drop dead next to me and 10,000 on my right hand. But it doesn't matter what may come in my space that is causing thousands to drop dead, that is causing thousands to be afflicted, troubled, whether it be spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, whatever. It will not come near me. Only with my eyes will I see it. Why? Why? Because I've chosen, verse number nine, to make the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, what? My dwelling. Because I've chosen to dwell in him, dwell in his peace. And notice, Missy, we're not required to do anything else. Shaquana, we're not required to do anything else. David says, because I have made the most high my dwelling place and my refuge because no matter what I'm dealing with or facing, I go to the Father and take rest in him. I put whatever it is in his hands. Whatever this battle is, I put it in his hands. Whatever this struggle is, I put it in his hands. David says, because I've done this, no evil shall befall me. We're not required to do anything else but trust him. Not required to do anything else but rest in him. Not required to do anything else but make him my refuge. And David says, because I do these things, the battle's already won. I just got to stand and rest in him. Are y'all with me? David says, uh, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come to your dwelling. Why? Because since, because you have taken rest and trust in God, because you've said to God, God, in spite of what I'm dealing with or facing, in spite of what the situation is, I'm going to trust, lean, and depend on you. He's now given his angels charge over you and I. Because I've now surrendered and said where I could fight, I'm going to trust you. I now release God to release his angels to take charge over me. Y'all see that? 
The enemy wants us to get so caught up in trying to deal with stuff in and of our own selves because he realized when we deal with it in and of our own selves, we now get in God's way and we preclude God from releasing his angels to do battle on our behalf. Y'all didn't catch that. I think the reason why we are still here today collectively as a ministry is because we have learned when to fight in and of ourselves and we have learned when to lay down and let God be our refuge and trust him to do battle for us. I, I believe the reason why you're still here today is because there's some areas in your life where you've come to the place and recognize God. I can't do this by myself. I've tried it. So I'm putting it in your hands. And the moment you did that. You release God to release his angels to do battle on the devil better than you could ever do. And that's the place, that's the position, that's the posture that we have to come from in this series that we're in, in understanding how to navigate spiritual warfare. When you come to the place where you understand, I don't care what the devil does or says. But God, you are my refuge, and because you are my refuge, release your angels to fight for me. Now day the devil has to run scared because he realizes and understands, watch this, that his arms, as the old folk used to say, are too short to box with God. Y'all with me? All right, so let's keep going. Uh, he, he, David says, uh, for he shall give his angels charge over you. They have a responsibility over you. You are now in their charge. To keep you in what? All your ways. So in all my ways, because I've made God my refuge, just going to bless somebody, his angels are meant to cover me. So because I'm walking in God's will, because I'm walking in God's purpose, because I'm being obedient to God, God's angels are not only keeping me in my health, but they're keeping my marriage. They, they're not just keeping my marriage, but they're keeping my children. They're not just keeping my children, but they're keeping my business. They're not just keeping my business, but they're keeping my employment. Whatever area that you're in, they're not just keeping my employment, but they're keeping me on the school in school. They're not just keeping me in school, but they're keeping my grandchildren. Wherever th that area is, because you have submitted to God, now his angels have charge over you, not just in some areas, but in all areas. Okay, let me break it down and give an example. I, I remember my practice is only now about uh, seven, two, four years old. Yeah, I had to double check. Seven, it's only four years old. So I'm relatively new to the practice of law, running a business and practicing law. And I remember I was in this hunt, you know, trying to pick up additional mentors because it's one thing to learn law in law school. It's another thing to actually have to practice it. I'm starting this law firm at 27 years of age. Dad just passed. Trying to come into the pastorship. Uh, I'm trying to establish my career. And I'm looking for mentors that will help and advise so that I can continue to grow and blossom as an attorney and avoid as many mistakes as I can uh, so, so I can have a successful career. I'm trying to find folk that I can lean on and glean wisdom from so that I don't have to recreate wheels. And as I was in the hunt looking for mentors and folk I could follow, there was one individual uh, among several who I came across or didn't know before, uh, but who I heard good things about, and I reached out and tried to connect with this individual. And we connected, we talked, Several times went out to dinner uh, with this individual. Individual had been practicing much longer than I had been practicing. Not uh, about, has about maybe 15 years on me as far as age. Been practicing much longer than I have. And I felt like this was a great experience. This was about to be a great experience. I was about to learn a lot from this individual because this individual seemed to be very capable. But, Irby, there was something in my spirit that I just could not get comfortable with. And as much as I tried to push the issue with God, God just would not allow me to finalize the conversations to allow me to uh, come into some sort of 
uh, mentor, uh, mentee relationship with this particular individual? Well, I came to realize on this past week, I let years go by, uh, the, comp the relationship just fell apart, not because of anything on my part or the individual's part, just God frustrated the, the event or frustrated the attempt. Stick with me, y'all. Uh, God, no matter how we just tried to make it work, our attempts were frustrated. And I thank God for those times where he frustrates our attempts. Well, I found out on this past week why God frustrated every attempt. I thank God for years of studying Psalms 91 and my spiritual leadership requiring me to learn it by heart. Because that part of verse number 11, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways, I learned and saw for myself on this past week. I happened to come across an article about this individual and that this individual had been removed from the practice of law for some decisions that this individual made that this individual should not have made. Now just imagine if God did not frustrate the efforts, who knows what I might have been connected to if it wasn't for God keeping me in all my ways. Y'all didn't catch that. Who knows how my career may have been derailed if I was not obedient to the frustration or the, the, uh, the attempts of the Holy Ghost to frustrate my efforts, who knows how I might have been hindered, ensnared. But because I made a decision a long time ago to make God my refuge and my dwelling place, he has given his angels charge over me in every area, watch this, so in that space, it didn't have nothing to do with my faith, it didn't have nothing to do with me as far as being a preacher, but in the secular realm of me working as a lawyer, even in that space, God was working. What are you trying to say? I don't care what area you are dealing with, if you are submitted to God and trusting God and make God your refuge and your dwelling, he promises to have his angels cover you in every area in which you're working. Y'all see that? And so the text tells us that not only does he give his angels charge over you to keep you in, your, in all your ways, but they do another thing, that they bear you up in their hands. Verse 12, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Not only does God give his angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways, but they lift me up in their hands over the very things that the enemy puts in my way to cause me to trip and stumble. The traps and the snares and the things that the enemy would put in my path to cause me to get derailed from that which God has for my life because I've submitted to his will, because I've submitted to his way, because I've submitted to his purpose over my life. Now those angels have a responsibility, watch this, to lift me up over the very things that the enemy has put in my path to trip me up. And I know that is somebody's testimony that can help me on this Wednesday night can testify to the fact that there were some spaces in your life where the enemy just knew he had you, just knew he had you tripped up, hemmed up, bound up, just knew that you were surely going to fall. But God showed up and lifted you up above the very thing that Satan's desire to snare you and destroy you. This is the promise that God gives us. And it all and God does all of this simply because we trust him and rest in him. The text tells us verse 13, because of this you shall tread upon the lion and the adder or the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Why? Because he has set his love upon me because you and I Set our love upon the Lord God. Therefore, I being God, he promises, will deliver him, will deliver you, will deliver me. Why? Because uh, I will set him on high. Why? Because he has known my name. 
He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. That breaks down like this. Because we love God, he will deliver us. Because we set him on high, he promises to set us on high. Why? Because we acknowledge his name. Y'all see that? Because I love God, he promises to deliver me. Because I acknowledge his name and praise his name and glorify his name, it doesn't matter who tries to keep you down, he promises to lift you up. Y'all with me? He says, and because of that, if we call upon him, he will do what? Answer us. Not only will he answer us, but when I'm in trouble, he'll be there. Not only will he be there, but he will deliver us. Not only will he deliver us, but he will honor us. He'll be faithful unto us. Not only will he honor us and be faithful unto us and reward us, but he will give us a long life. Why? Simply because we made him our refuge. Simply because we made him our dwelling place. So how do you wage war against Satan? The first thing you've got to do, I said it before, I'm going to say it again, is trust God. No matter how the storm looks, no matter how the waves roar, no matter how the wind blows, if you trust God, you've already gotten the victory. Y'all with me? I don't care how crazy your kids might be acting. I don't care how crazy life may be. If you trust God, you've already gotten the victory, all right? All right, let's go on. Go on to Psalms 119. Psalms 119. And we're going to look at verses 11 through 16. Psalms 119. And we're going to look at verses 11 through 16. If there are any questions, feel free to ask them, whether it be here or in the chat, comments, etc. Psalms 119, verses 11 through 16. From the New King James Version, it reads like this. Your word. Here we go again. The word, your word, I, being the writer, have written in, have hidden in my heart that I what? Might not sin against you. Sin, we always go, when we talk about sin, is the sexy stuff, the rob, the, the murder, the cheat, the well, all other type of stuff. But you know that doubting is a sin? Not trusting God is a sin? Y'all with me? And David, the, the writer tells us, your word, God, I have hidden in my heart. It's deep in my heart. It's so deep, it can't be seen. And because it can't be seen, it can't be taken. Your word, I have hidden in my heart. For what purpose? That I not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will what? Meditate on your precepts. And I will what? Contemplate your ways. Let's stop there for a moment. The writer tells us, he's writing this meditation unto God. And he writes, I've hidden your word in my heart. To hide the word in my heart means I have what? Read the word. I have taken the time to read your word. I have invested my time into making your word part of my reality. And because I have invested the time to make your word part of my reality, in the spaces in my life where Satan would try to cause me 
to walk away from God in the places in my life where Satan would try to tempt me to move against God's will, in the places in my life where Satan would try to get me to deviate, I won't do it. Not because of how strong I am. Y'all see that? But because your word, what? Lives on the inside of me. All of us, I don't care what position that you hold in the, in the body of Christ, whether you are a chief apostle, prelate, whatever your title may be, or the newest baby Christian in the body of Christ. All of us are susceptible to falling into diverse temptation. I don't care how senior you are. I don't care how junior you are. Satan desires to have us to what? Sift us like wheat. But as Jesus prayed for Peter, the blood of Jesus has also made that prayer available to us. What did Jesus say to Peter? But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. All of us find ourselves in those places where we are tried and we are tested. And sometimes, I don't care how senior or how junior you are, sometimes we fail. And I argue to you, y'all, maybe the reason why we have failing moments is because we haven't taken enough time to hide his word deep in the heart. Maybe there's an area that the enemy is using, because remember Paul told us that temptation first begins on the inside. We're born in sin, shaped in iniquity. It's a, it's a desire that is not submitted to the will of God, and Satan knows exactly how to exploit it. And maybe we would get more successes as opposed to failures. If all of us from every pulpit to every back door just took a little bit more time and staying connected with the word of God. I don't care how well you can quote it. When was the last time you read it? I don't care how well you can quote it. When was the last time you became intimate with the word of God and, and spent hours in prayer and hours in reading and seeking revelation from God? That's where our strength is. That's where our source is. That's where our power is. That's where our deliverance is. And I argue to you all that the life and the health of the church would get better if all of us from every pulpit to every book back door took as much time that we take on Netflix with the word of God. All right, let me not sit there. He says, let me, I, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. What does he mean by that? That I might not be tempted, be drawn away uh, because to put my will over your will. I've hidden my word in my heart so that when Satan does come or when opportunities present themselves like uh, uh, the opportunity that Joseph had with his master's wife, the opportunity was there for him to do what any man in his position might have done. But because the word of God was in what? His heart, he told his master's wife, yeah, no, I can't do that because my master Potiphar trusts me with everything in his house. Trust me that I will be a good servant to it. Therefore, I can't touch you. And more than my master, it would displease my God. Y'all with me? Any other man might have slipped and fallen, but because... The word of God was in his heart. David goes on to write, the writer goes on to say, uh, therefore God teach me your statutes. Uh, my, with my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all the riches. But this is the part I'm going to focus on. Verse 15. I will what? Meditate. That means take time to focus on. To push aside everything else and to ponder and to think and to spend time with your precepts and contemplate, think on your ways. 
So I'm not just uh, coming to Bible study. I'm not just coming to church on Sunday, but I'm taking time to read and meditate on your precepts and on your ways, God. I, I'm taking the time to date your word and date your spirit because I understand in the moments where I need strength, in those moments where the enemy is coming and I don't have my Bible, in the moments where the enemy is coming and pastor can't get to me, in the moments where the enemy is coming and, and I can't pick up the phone and call nobody, I can call on your name. And I know what to say and how to say why. Because I've taken the requisite time to think on, to meditate and contemplate your precepts and your ways. Imagine how powerful the kingdom of God on this earth could be if we as believers didn't just profess his ways, but spent time studying who he is. Y'all catch that? Y'all with me? Uh, okay, let me, let, me, let me wrap this up. He says, therefore, I will delight myself in your statutes, and I will not forget your words. So to be successful in whatever battle that we may find ourselves in, we have to trust him, as I've said so many times before. But then we also have to spend time with him, spend time with his words, spend time with the Holy Ghost. Because the time to understand who he is and how he works in the word of God is not when you're under attack, but it's before the attack. Y'all with me? The time to prepare for a fight on your household is not when the devil comes knocking on your door, but prior to him even getting on your street. Y'all with me? All right, let's go on. If there are no questions or comments, if there are no questions or comments, let's go on to uh, Isaiah 55. Or if you can give me a rag from, uh, uh, from off the pulpit, Isaiah 55, please and thank you. Isaiah number 55. We're in good time. Isaiah number 55. And we're going to look at verse number 10 through 11. In Isaiah chapter 55, we see the prophet Isaiah talking about this invitation to abundant life. But I want us to focus in on verses 10 through 11. We should all be there. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there. As the rain comes down and as the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed, thank you, uh, to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word, being the word of God, that goes forth from my mouth. Now stop there for a moment before we finish the part that everybody's familiar with. Isaiah has the mouthpiece for God, says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there. So it rains and it snows. And sometimes, y'all, rain and snow can be a nuisance. Y'all didn't catch that. Sometimes rain and snow can be a nuisance. What you trying to say, preacher? Sometimes things come that feel like nuisances, and it ain't always from the devil. Okay, y'all didn't catch that. that. That's for somebody in the E, -E campus. Uh, this is where discernment comes in and, and knowing God and spending time with his word and trusting him in in season and out of season comes to play. Because sometimes it rains, and it ain't pretty. It doesn't lull me to sleep. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't you know, create a peaceful atmosphere. Sometimes rain brings about floods. 
Sometimes snows bring about blizzards. Y'all with me? And, and, and Isaiah, being the mouthpiece for God, says, As the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return, yes, it comes. And sometimes it comes in ways that uh, comforts us, and sometimes it comes in ways where it has moments where it frustrates us, but understand that it has purpose. And this is where trusting God comes in and not allowing the voice of the devil to make you doubt God. Just because it's raining in your life doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. Just because it's snowing in your life doesn't mean that God has forsaken you. Could it be that God is using that to water your next step? Y'all didn't catch that. Y'all missed that. Maybe this thing God has allowed to come into your space, not to kill you, not to drown you, not to cause you to re uh, retard back to a place that God delivered you from, but maybe God is using whatever that is to water your next step and the next phase in your life. What Zion, maybe God is using all of these things that the enemy meant for evil to water the next step in the next phase that God has for us. Maybe the, whatever it is that the enemy thinks is being used for evil in your life, God allowed for it to come into your space as he allowed it in Job's life not to break you, but to water your next phase. And see, what the enemy doesn't want us to see is that whether it's raining or sun shining, God is still good. What Satan doesn't want us to focus in on is whether it's a clear day outside or a blizzard, my God is still faithful. And he promised that he would never leave or forsake me. So whatever I might have to deal, I may have to pick up my spiritual shovel, but I'm going to trust him as I'm pushing it. Y'all with me? I might have to put up my spiritual umbrella, but I'm going to trust him anyhow because I know that he promised to work all things together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So maybe, Zion, maybe, whether you're here or at home, maybe, I just want to challenge your way of thinking, maybe that thing can not to break you but to water your next phase and the prophet Isaiah writing as the mouthpiece of God says for as the rain comes down and, and, and the snow from heaven and do not return here but it comes for a purpose and what is that not to destroy uh, but to water the earth and make it what bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me being God, what? Void. So whatever God said to you, about your life, about the life of those connected to you, about everything that is connected to you. It doesn't matter what may fall in your space. It doesn't matter what storm may show up in your space. What God said to you, he promises that his word shall not means that there is zero possibility for his word to come back void. When he says shall not, it means it must not, it will not. There is zero chance of something that God said not coming to pass. Now understand, here we go again, that you may not envision the outcome. Or the outcome may not be what you initially wanted or expected. But that doesn't mean that his word came back void. Okay, let me, let me, let me break it down. Uh, yes, we pray for Reverend Stephano Thomas Sr. to be healed. And yes, God told my, our, our pastor, 
you're going to get some bad news, but everything's going to be okay. Yes, we took that to mean that God was going to do what we wanted him to do. And even though God didn't do what we what? wanted him to do, doesn't mean that his word came back what? Y'all see that? Pastor, how can you say that? Uh, your dad's not here. He's not here, but there's life after life. Y'all didn't catch that. He, we, he, God may not have given us what we wanted, but he's now living in a land where there's no more pain, where there's no more sorrow, where there's no more sickness, where there's no more disease, where cancer doesn't even have a space. So God may not have given what we wanted. Doesn't mean that his word is void. Y'all with me? And so what the enemy wants us to focus on in those struggles, in those transition moments, is, well, because God didn't give you what you prayed for, that his word was void. And what we have to transition into thinking as mature Christians as we continue to wage through spiritual warfare is that in seasons in our lives, God may not give us exactly what we prayed for. And you have to have the spiritual discernment and maturity to recognize in the spaces that God doesn't give you what you asked for, that he still did what he said he was going to do. Y'all catch that? It takes a grown Christian to recognize the spaces where God didn't give me what I asked, but he still did what he said. Y'all catch that? Because his thoughts are not our thoughts. And his ways are what? Not our ways. And where many of us lose the battle is Satan wants us to get caught up on our thoughts and our ways and think that our thoughts and our ways are God's thoughts and God's ways. And when God don't respond as we expected him to, well, then something must be wrong. And we've got to come back to the place and understand whether he does it the way we want to or not, he's still God, and he said his word will not come back void. And so if he did it this way, it means he's got a reason for it that I'll understand better by and by. Y'all yeah. with me? He says, my word shall not return to me what? Void. So if it doesn't return to me void, then what will it do? I'm glad you asked. God says to the prophet Isaiah, instead of returning to me void, notice y'all, what I'm just taught a few seconds ago is right here in the verse. Instead of returning to me void, it shall what? Accomplish what I, being God, not you, not me, but it shall accomplish what I being God, what? Please. So there's some moments in your lives where God's will is going to be done, and it may not in the moment be everything that you thought. But if you trust him, in his time, he'll show you it was everything that you need. And you'll give God grace and you'll give him glory and you'll say, God, I trust you. I trust you. And I'm grateful that I trusted you. Even in those moments where I thought that you had abandoned me and forsaken me and didn't do exactly what I prayed for. In fact, now that I can look back over life, I can give you praise and say, I'm thankful that you didn't do what I, can, can, can anybody testify that you had some moments in your life where you can look back and say, God, I'm grateful that you didn't answer my prayer the way I asked it because if you had answered my prayer the way I asked I wouldn't be where I am today and this is how we got to think as mature Christians and if we think this way we continue to curtail every avenue that Satan would use as a resource to talk us out of God's will for our lives God says to the right Isaiah but my word will accomplish what I, being God, please. And not only that, but and it shall prosper. So not only will it accomplish what I please, but it shall, being must, being will, prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Can I just sit there for a moment? The fact that you are alive today 
means that there is something that God has in his will for your life to do and accomplish. And he said that his word will not come back void, but it shall accomplish what I what I please and prosper in the thing which I sent it. So that means the fact that you and I are still alive means that there is something that God has put on the inside of us that we must accomplish and not only accomplish but prosper. Are y'all with me? And this is why the enemy hunts us down so much. This is why the enemy attacks our homes and attacks our minds and attacks our health and attacks this, that, and the third because he wants to do everything Everything that he can to keep God's will for your life and my life from not only being accomplished but also prospering. Y'all see that? And I've come to the place in my life with every success and every failure where I'm recognizing and understanding that God, I want to live a life where not only I accomplish your will but I prosper. Y'all with me? And to do that requires us to simply trust God, to believe in him, to obey him, to rely on him in every area that we find ourselves in, to not allow the enemy to talk us out of our blessing as Esau allowed Jacob, Jacob to talk him out of his. All right, let's go on real quick to chapter uh, 59 in Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 59. You can read the whole chapter on your own, but I want us to focus in on, hone in on uh, verse number 19. Isaiah 59, verse number 19. And then uh, Isaiah 59, specifically verses number around 16 to the end, we see uh, the prophet Isaiah talking about uh, Israel being redeemed, is Zion being redeemed, and specifically the Redeemer of Zion, right? Uh, talking about our Lord to come, being our salvation, or being the salvation of Israel. But I want us to focus in on uh, verse number 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will what? Lift up a standard against him. So specifically, and we see the prophet Isaiah writing as the mouthpiece of God, talking about uh, Israel being separated from God talking about sin being confessed, talking about because we were separated, specifically Israel and, and by extension all of humanity, being separated from God because of sin, but then confessing and turning back to God that the Redeemer would come and redeem Israel and by coming and redeeming Israel through his blood, redeeming us. But then the part that I love is that he says, that the enemies of God will fear his name. And that goes beyond whatever human battle we're fighting. And let's look at it from a spiritual perspective, which means that the adversary that we fight, the accuser of the brethren, fears the name of the Lord. Well, we're heirs and joint heirs with Christ Jesus, which means that we carry his name. Y'all didn't catch that. Y'all missed that. That went over your heads. Let me say it like this. Because Christ came through 40 and two generations and died for us on the cross, we now have access and benefit to the same redemptive power that was sent to redeem the children of God, which means every enemy, every adversary, every foe, every tool that Satan would use to attack and disrupt God's will for our lives, he fears not because of how mighty we are, but because of whose name we carry. Y'all with me? Y'all missed that. Uh, because I carry his name, 
I don't have to lift my hands to fight nobody. Y'all with me? The name of God does all the fighting for me. Paul, Peter, when they walked in an atmosphere, they didn't have to fight any demon, any illness or disease. They talk, uh, talked about how when uh, Paul, when Peter would walk in into a room, how uh, demons would shift, atmospheres would shift, people would get healed. Why? Because of the presence of God that they carried on the inside, because of the name that they carried. Are y'all with me? Well, we walk in that same authority. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, not just earthly enemies, not just those that Satan would seek to use to distract, to distract, to destroy us, but even in the spirit realm, when the enemy comes in like a flood, one thing after another, and I feel like I'm at the point where I'm about to lose my mind. When the enemy comes in like a flood, if one more thing gets piled on my table, I might just go crazy. When the enemy comes in like a flood, I don't know how to handle all these fires that are all around me. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost, the text tells us, what? Lifts up a standard. Not Shaquanda. Not Janice. Not Melissa, not Donnie, not uh, Miss Annette, not Stephanie, not Sister Thomas, not Destiny, not Irving, not Shania, not uh, Sam, not uh, uh, Miss Janet, not Janet, not Rock, not, not, not Nate, not Joyce, not Connie, on down the church floor. But when the enemy comes in like a flood, you mean to tell me I don't have to go try to figure out the levies to put up in my life? No. You mean to tell me I, I don't have to go shore up my, my, uh, my, no, my home? No. I, you mean to tell me I don't have to exert some physical effort or in and of myself? No. Before you can even do it, the text tells us that when the enemy would come in like a flood, the Holy Ghost lifts the standard against him. Y'all see that? So here we see yet again, if I'm trusting God, if I'm making him my refuge, if I'm making him my dwelling place, if I'm leaning in him and trusting him and obeying him, meditating in him and contemplating him and spending time romancing God and, and being inundated with his word and hiding his word in my heart so that I not sin against him, distrust him, disbelieve him, move outside of his will and move in my will, then when Satan would come, I'm prepared for battle, but the Holy Ghost has already lifted up the standard for me. Y'all see that? And can you imagine the peace that all of us would have resting in that knowledge? Can you imagine the sleep you're going to have tonight when you go home saying, wait, I don't have to fight this thing. Wait, I don't have to figure it all out by myself. Wait, I don't have to have all the answers. Wait, I don't have to be the one to resolve this. Wait, I don't have to be the one whose pressure is going to go up because the Holy Ghost has already lifted the standard. The Holy Ghost is already advocating on my behalf. The Holy Ghost is already fighting for me. And it's that knowledge that gives us the rest. It's that knowledge that gives us comfort. It's that knowledge that gives us the ability to rest even when Satan comes in and says, you know God can't do it. I'm not listening to that because he said he would do it. And I trust him. When Satan comes and says it's impossible, I'm not entertaining it. Why? Because he did it before and he'll do it again. This is how we fight our battles. When we are surrounded, we take a second look. Like Elisha instructed his servant. And when we take that second look, we recognize that even though I may be surrounded by my enemies, there's another army surrounding my enemies. Because I am God's child, because he is my Lord, because I've taken refuge in him. There is nothing that can come into my space where if I call on the name of the Lord, he won't respond. Y'all see that? All right, write this down in your book. I'm going to read it. 
for just for time's sake. We read it before, but I just want to read it again. Write it in your book, Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter twenty. Second Chronicles, chapter twenty. Uh, but specifically for tonight, we're going to focus on verses twelve through fifteen. Second Chronicles, chapter twenty, verse twelve through fifteen. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of uh, Benaiah, the son of uh, Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite, and the son of Aspa, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this multitude for the battle is not yours but it's God's it's the Lord's we read it a few weeks ago we read it again today Jehoshaphat and the kingdom of Judah were surrounded by their enemies a multitude stood against them and they did not have the ability to fight back and all of Judah is trembling in fear but the Spirit of God falls on the man of God and he tells the people, don't you worry about it. Don't worry about who surrounds you. Don't worry about who's come against you. Don't worry about this multitude. Why? Because the multitude, thank you, Holy Ghost, the multitude is showing up thinking that they're about to fight you. That ought to make you shout. Well, uh, the multitude has shown up thinking they're about to fight you. You only catch that. All right, for the e-canvases. That thing has showed up in your life thinking it's about to fight you. But what it will quickly realize is that once it shows up on the battlefield, it ain't fighting you and I. But God says to Jehoshaphat, and by extension of his word in the blood of Jesus to us, that I quickly tag in. And so it's not you in the ring fighting your enemy. The battle is not yours, it's mine. So don't worry about what they may say. Don't worry about what the devil may say. Don't worry about what's going on. You just remember that I said the battle is not yours. I've come to understand the secret of how our pastor could sleep in the midst of folk talking about they were going to foreclose on the building because he recognized, I don't care how big they come, the bigger they are, the what? Harder they fall. Why? Because I'm not taking them down in and of myself, but there's an army that stands behind me greater than any army of flesh and blood. There's an army that stands behind me greater than any army that I can assemble. And it is the heavenly host that comes from on high. And when you can rest in the fact and know that you got God on your side and his army behind you, you can walk with the confidence that God and the blood of Jesus has purchased for you because you'll remind yourself, wait, this ain't my battle. And even though the word prepares me, and even though I've got the whole arm of God on me, as written in Ephesians chapter 6, I recognize that even though I'm prepared for battle, I don't have to fight. Y'all see that? All right, for time's sake, let's keep going. If there are any questions, comments, now's the time. Put them in the chat. If there are, we'll take the time to deal with it. If not, we're going to keep on moving. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18. Questions, comments, question, comments. If they are, shout it out. If not, I'm going to keep rolling. Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to start at verse number 18. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, now we're in the New Testament. 
Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to begin at verse number 18. I encourage you to read Matthew chapter 18 on your own. We don't have time to go through everything. Uh, but we're going to hone in on 18 and 19. Matthew 18, verse 18 and 19 reads from the New King James like this. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you what? Y'all with me? Let's read it together. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you what? Bind on earth will be what? Bound in heaven. And whatever you what? Loose on earth will what? Be loosed in heaven. Okay, well, hold on. Let's, let's stop there for a moment. Let's go to the New Living Translation. Reads like this. I tell you the truth. I love it. From New, King, New Living. Watch this. I tell you the truth. Whatever you forbid on earth will be what? Well, you, you're not with me, but I'll read it for you. Forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted. All right, Irving, look up the word forbid. Uh, Shaquan and Missy or, 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 or Miss Janice, look up the word permitted or permit. Forbid being the root word of forbidden. Uh, permit being the root word for uh, permitted. Look up the word forbid. Look up the word permit. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. What does the word forbid mean, Irving? Forbid is the word for means to allow. In the verb form, forbid means, you might want to write this down, to refuse to allow. Write that down. To forbid means to refuse to be allowed. Forbid means to refuse. So you mean to tell me that as a believer, there are some things I can speak to on the earth and refuse to be allowed. And the Son of God says that if I refuse for it to be allowed on earth, it will ref be refused. Y'all see that? In heaven. You mean to tell me forbid means to refuse to be allowed. So life and death is in the power of the what? Tongue. So I can speak on earth. And forbid something, and heaven will forbid it. Okay, Missy, what is the definition? Who has the definition? You have the definition? What does permit mean? Permit means to authorize or give permission. You ought to write that down. Forbid means refuse to be allowed, while permit means to authorize. Or give permission, or to allow. Is that what you say? To authorize, give permission. Refuse to allow, to authorize, grant permission. Refuse to authorize, to refuse to allow, to authorize, grant permission. Now do you understand why it is that we have to be careful of what we allow moments to cause us to speak? Y'all didn't catch that. Y'all missed that. Now do you see why you've got to be careful to not allow a momentary frustration to cause you to speak out of self and not out of the spirit? Because Satan operates in moments. Luke 4 is a great example of that. We also see it, I believe it's in the book of Mark. But Jesus is in the wilderness and been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And Satan tempts Jesus in what? Moments. 
and tries to get Jesus to move in the moment. That's how Esau lost uh, his birthright because Jacob spoke to his moment. And you got to be careful because Satan will speak to your moments to try to get to your future. Y'all you you missed that. Y'all missed that. Satan will speak to moments to try to delay or abort your future. And remember, we learned that Satan has no new tricks. He has no tools against us except that which we give him. So we, he can't forbid God's will for our lives. But he can manipulate us into forbidding God's will over our lives. Y'all didn't catch that. Let me break it down even further. Satan can't frustrate and stop God's will for our lives. But we're the ones that can refuse to allow or permit to allow. So, if he can get into my spirit, bring folk into my spirit to cause me to speak contrary to what God says, then it is me that has allowed Satan to get the better of me to cause heaven to stop what God wants to do. Let me give you an example of that. My, uh, my mom and everybody used to get on me. Stop saying that you owe. Stop saying that you owe. We know what you mean, your own soul, but stop saying that you owe. I meant it in a joking way, but one day I got up not too long ago, and I felt old. Lie to you not. Got up one day to come to work, and I just felt so exhausted. My knees hurt like they never hurt before. And I just felt tired and decrepit at 31 years of age. To the point where I recognized, wait a minute. I need to stop saying that I'm old. So when I would walk around, Shaquan would say, oh, you old? I get up slowly. You old? I say, no, I ain't old. I know I said it before, but I'm not saying it now. Why? Because I recognize and understand that I've been saying it, and now the atmosphere is responding to that which I spoke over my life. Y'all with me? My mentor, one of my mentors, Billy Murphy, I remember and I was interning with him my first year of law school, my one-hour summer. The uh, uh, man is in his 80s. And I remember I was interning with him. And, uh, and we were talking. And he leaned back. And he propped his feet up on the table. And we saw it was quick. And I'm like, how did he do that? He old. Well, how did he lift himself up that quick? If you saw him today, shout out uh, to Billy Murphy, love you, boss. He would, you would not think that he is as old as he is. Why? He told me. He said, because I don't think old. I don't operate like I'm old. I think like I'm young. I uh, carry myself like I'm young. I carry myself like I have energy. I force myself to stay healthy and relevant and vibrant. I refuse to allow myself to succumb to what time, society, etc. says that I should be. Y'all missed that. I don't know what it is that life and the society and the enemy would have you to classify yourself as. But remember the word says that we can forbid, refuse to allow, or uh, permit authorize and whatever we refuse to allow or authorize heaven responds so if I speak something it happens if I speak death it happens if I speak inability to move forward it happens if I speak an inability to find a new relationship it happens if I speak an inability to whatever it happens but if I speak life It'll happen. If I speak success, it'll happen. If I speak failure, it'll happen. Could it be that the reason why you're not seeing transformation in your life is not because God ain't faithful, but because your words have handcuffed heaven? Y'all see that? 
And Satan loves to bait us into places and spaces where our words handcuff heaven. Where our words retard God's ability to move as he will want to move in our lives. And we get frustrated with God and say, well, God, why aren't you doing? God, why aren't you moving? God, uh, Satan said you wouldn't do it, and here you didn't. God says, wait a minute now. It's not that I didn't want to do it, not that I couldn't do it, but do you remember that three nights ago in your room, you allowed a momentary experience to cause you to speak out of self and not out of me, and the enemy got exactly what he wanted. You spoke something that was dropped in your spirit that was contrary to what I was telling you, and now you have forbid it on earth, and now it's forbidden in heaven. And this is how he likes to move. This is how he plays. This is how he fights. Because remember, he has no weapons that he can use successfully against us except manipulation, except trickery. He's the father of lies. But if you did your assignment that I asked you several weeks ago and look, looked over the places in your life where Satan caught you and got you before, you would recognize those tools and you would see exactly what we're talking about tonight. That there were spaces that I spoke it and it happened. There were spaces that I, that I called it and it happened. There were spaces where I didn't pull down the stronghold in according to the word, but I fed it and Satan had room to move. I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on the earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on the earth will be permitted in heaven. Let's close it out from the New Living Translation. I also tell you this. If two of you agree here on earth concerning not some things, but anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. Don't, don't, don't switch over. I'm going back to the New King James Version. Watch this. Let's read it there. He says, whatever you bind on earth, bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, loose in heaven. He says, but then... Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything, anything, not some things, but anything, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything, they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven for where two or three are gathered together in my name I am there in the midst of them alright alright let's illustrate this real quick I need somebody come up somebody anybody if you can walk if you can get here quick let's go put your mask on watch this whatever you bind on earth quick 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 I need to volunteer quick 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 whatever you bind on earth bound in heaven Loose on earth, loose in heaven, but where two are gathered together, y'all with me? Agreeing on the earth, ask anything, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Watch this. We don't even have to touch. The verse says, we just have to be on the earth and agree. And where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Okay, so Shaquanda, can you see her on camera? Come up some. Is here, right? Now let's imagine, let's take the first part of, of verse 19 and then do the second, right? So let's say Shaquanda is on the west side of town. No, let's flip it. I'm on the west side of town. And Shaquanda is on the east side of town. But I know that there is something that she's been praying for and I've been praying for. The word says that we have the authority 
to forbid or permit. And that if we are in agreement that the Father in heaven will do it. So let's say, for example, uh, I don't know, say what, say something. I don't know, what are you praying for? Uh, something, it could be anything. It don't have to even be real. What'd you say? She said a man. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know how to handle that. <laughs> I wasn't expecting I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, the word said anything. So, uh, uh, all right, so we'll, we'll just run with that. So she's praying for a man, right? And we're going to say a godly man, a God-fearing man, uh, uh, a man that is uh, everything that God would have for her life, right? And so uh, we're in agreement, right? We don't even have to be touching. We're in two separate sides of Baltimore. But we are spiritually in agreement. On this particular thing. Y'all with me? We are in agreement. And we are praying and speaking. God, in the name of Jesus, I heard a preacher say this. Uh, uh, he said he's thankful for the, the prayers of frustration. Uh, the prayers that he, sometimes you got to learn to pray prayers of frustration. What is a prayer of frustration? God, I pray in your name that you frustrate any attempt, whether it be an attempt of the devil or even an attempt out of my flesh that would seek to uh, pull me out of your will and your way. I pray in Jesus' name that you will frustrate my efforts, uh, efforts that, would, uh, that I might have to do things that are outside of your will that would cost me uh, that which you've called for my life. I pray that you frustrate them so that my will not be done, that your will might be. Y'all see that? That's how you bind things, right? So let's say that we get into prayer and we, we Shaquan is praying and believing, right? And we say, God, in the name of Jesus, we're praying, we're touching and agreeing for Shaquan's life. And let's say I'm in my prayer closet and she's in her prayer closet. And we're like, God, you know everything that she stands in the need of that I'm her prayer partner. And God, we've been praying uh, that you would send the right uh, help meet in her space, uh, somebody that would help her in this next phase of her life and journey with you. God, we pray even now that you will frustrate, that you will bind every attempt of the devil to preclude her from moving into this next phase of her life. God, it's our prayer even now that you loose every good thing that you will have for her life. God, we permit heaven to move on her behalf and that you will even now release the blessings of heaven for her life, that you would send the right person to walk with her and the right friends to walk with her. God, we release you to let your will be done. Y'all see what I'm saying? Now, I'm praying at my house and she praying at her house and we are in agreement in the name of Jesus. Well, guess what happens? God in heaven is hearing the prayer. Y'all see that? And so because we are in agreement, because our faith is connected, we've now bound the things of the devil, loose the things of the Holy Ghost, and the Bible tells us, Christ tells us, now God the Father will what? Respond. Y'all see that? Y'all see that? This is the power of prayer. This is the power of us connecting with each other. I don't want people in my business. Well, the scripture says... Right, how you move heaven. And not only does the power lie in your tongue, but it lies in your neighbor's tongue. And sometimes there are demons. Remember, one can chase a thousand a flight, two can chase what? 10,000 a flight. You got to get so out of this, I don't want folk in my business, and be willing to be human and humble and say, will you join in prayer with me? Will you help me put 10,000 demons to flight by praying with me? Right? And so we're praying together. We're, we're, let's say that we're praying about uh, that God will bring transformation in my business, whatever it might be. So now we're in prayer. Now we're, we're shifting heaven. We're, we're arresting the move of the devil. We're arresting the hand of Satan. And we're loosing God to loose his angels to do battle on our behalf as he promised in Psalms 91. Y'all see this? All because we're in agreement. Look at how Satan works. This is why he attacks the church. Because how's the church going to be healthy if we can't even pray for each other? How's the church going to be healthy if we can't even stand and look at each other in the eye? How's the church going to be healthy if I'm trying to use your past to break you down as opposed to using my words and my prayers to lift you up? Y'all with me? 
And this is how the kingdom of heaven is losing ground because we're not connected. Uh, let this mind be in you, which is what? Also in Christ Jesus. And it's not Christ Jesus' mindset to destroy your neighbor. Because the Bible tells us, Christ teaches us to love your neighbor as what? As you love yourself. So how can I say I'm moving in God if my words destroy my neighbor and not what? Build my neighbor. Imagine the battles that we would win if the body of Christ just connected spiritually. We are all watching virtually. Many of y'all have not yet come back into the, in the building. Guess what? We don't necessarily have to be here touching and agreeing for us to be in agreement spiritually. And if you have tuned out of what the ministry is doing and tuned out of what we're praying for, how can we in the spirit pray and lift you up if we don't know what's going on in your life? How can you lift us up if, we don't know what's going, if you don't know what's going on in our lives? And this is how Satan fights. Y'all see that? Okay, okay. So watch this. So we're in two sides of town. We pray, believed, we bound Satan on earth. So now if he's bound in heaven, loosed on earth, now God is loosed in heaven. Now watch this. Because we're on the earth and we're praying and we're in agreement, God responds. Now watch verse 20. Come here, Missy. Come here, Missy. Now, we're at two or three. Now here's, watch this, watch this. Here's why I love eCampus, but here's why we must not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. Watch this, because there's some things that we can do together while we're in separate spaces. But there's some things that can only be done when we're gathered together. Now watch this. Let's make a circle. Let's make a circle. Let's make a circle. Let's make a circle if we can, right? So I'm here. Now you come around me. You come around me, right? Right? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 you're right. You're, yeah, you're right. So they can see me, right? Well, yeah, close a little bit more. I'm sorry. Right? So now we got a circle, right? The Bible says, verse number 20, right? For where two or three are what? Gathered together, right? So some things we can pray and be in an agreement, and we're not even be in the same space. But watch this. Now two or three are gathered together. Notice, don't even say touching and green in this particular uh, chapter. Two or three are gathered together. What? In my name. So we're gathered together. But we're not gathered together because I want to see Miss You because I want to see Jaquanda. But we're gathered together in the Lord's name. We're gathered together for the purpose of lifting up the name of Jesus. We're gathered together for Christ to be the center and the focal point. We're gathered together for the lifting up the name of Jesus. Right? Y'all see this? And because we're now gathered together in his name, the Bible says, come here, Irving, that he now... That he now creeps up in the midst. Y'all see that? Come in a little closer. Right? So we were gathered together in his name. Y'all see that? We were gathered together in his name because we're now together in his name. God shows up. Y'all with me? So sometimes... We can't invoke the presence of God unless we are together in his name. There's some things that you just can't get sitting at home. But you got to at some point come together with another brother or another sister so that the presence of God can be evoked, invoked so that you can continue to wage war against you. Y'all see that? Right? Y'all see that? Now, if we gather together... And we gather together because we got stuff we want to talk about. Gather together because we're trying to spill the latest tea on so-and-so and, -so and he-and-he and he and whoever, whatever. We gather together because we want to see what he got on, she got on, they got on, whatever, whatever. And on the surface, it's about Jesus. On the surface, it's about worshiping God. On the surface, it's about giving him praise. But none of us have come together with our hearts and minds stayed on him. If we haven't done the worship at home, if we haven't done the praying at home, if we haven't done the meditating and the contemplating at home, we show up 
and we worship and we run around the church, come to the post shy, y'all saying the same thing over and over again, and we leave, and where's God? God said, I ain't getting up in that. Because you were gathered together, but it wasn't in my name. It wasn't for my glory. It wasn't for, my, it wasn't for the lifting up of me. And so many of our churches today are major, are big, got big budgets, but we got to ask the question, where's the Holy Ghost? Why is it that I'm saved and I'm going to church, but the devil got a room in my house? And I can't call nobody in my church to come to my house and grab that holy oil like the saints of old and run the devil out. Can I answer the question? Maybe it's because we've been gathering together, but not in his name. Y'all with me? Y'all see that? Okay, y'all can go back. I'm about to wrap this up. So, so what we see here in Matthew chapter 18 is this understanding that we can be miles apart. But when we're in agreement, one can chase a thousand a flight, two can chase ten thousand a flight. We can be miles apart, but if we're praying together and we're connected and we're in agreement, God responds. But if we want the presence of God to show up, two or three are required to be what? Gathered together in his name. Y'all see this? Don't let the enemy trick you out of getting God's presence. Don't let Satan trick you out of your time in receiving the Holy Ghost because you say, I'm not ready to come to church yet. But if you can go to every funeral, go to every cookout, go to the market, go to the movies, go to the restaurant, y'all with me, go to the shoe store, go to the bar, some of y'all, go to the club. Why is it that we can't come to church and gather together safely that the presence of God might show up. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, not even touching the green, but just gathering together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Y'all see that? I'm determined that whatever God is doing now, I don't want to miss it by allowing the enemy to trick me out of my appointed time with him. Because I'm not in prayer with my neighbor and they're not in prayer with me. Now we can't chase 10,000 a flight because we're not in agreement. I don't want to miss my time, my moment with the presence of God because I'm staying at home when I should be in church. I'm not making it up. I'm right here in the book. Any questions? That's fine. Any questions? Questions? Really quickly, really quickly, really quickly because my time is almost gone and past is hot in my suit. I'm about to go and change. My shit's been a long day. Luke, let's go on to Luke. Luke, chapter 1. We're going to finish on Luke, and we'll close out on next week. Are you being blessed? Have this whole season, series blessed you? If, it, if it's blessed you, let's just see some hearts, some thumbs up in the chats. Uh, is it blessing you? It's my prayer that it's been blessing you, that we've spent a significant amount of time equipping you in this This Means War series. All right, Luke, Luke, chapter number thir- chapter, chapter 1. And we're going to begin at verse number 37, Luke 1. Let's go on down to verse 37, Luke 1, 37. Luke 1, 37. Luke 1, 37. Watch this. The angel of the Lord speaks to Mary. Actually, let's go on up to verse 34. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, what being her conceiving without man? How can this be that I will conceive without the seed of a man? Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? How can this be that I'm going to be pregnant and I'm a virgin I've never had sex? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. She was old and she was barren. Her womb was closed 
and everybody knew it. Yet the angel of God says to her, she's six months pregnant with a son, even though everybody else said she was barren. How is this? Verse 37. For with God, nothing will be impossible. How do I wage this battle? Why is this verse important to me? Because I don't care what it is you're dealing with, what it is you're struggling with, what it is you're facing. Remember that with God, nothing is impossible. I don't have the education, yet God is telling me to do this. It's impossible. Yeah, by yourself. But with God, nothing, what, is impossible. I don't have the money. How am I supposed to start this? It ain't about what you can do. With God, what? Nothing. I've been in prison for 20 years. Nobody going to hire me. Why do you care about that? With God, what? Nothing. I can't read. How am I supposed to do it? It doesn't matter. With God, nothing. I was hooked on drugs. Who will ever trust me? It doesn't matter. With God, nothing is impossible. And that's how Satan attacks us. God, God can't do that. That's not possible. There ain't no way that's going to happen. It's outside of human understanding. There's no way that can happen. It's irrational. But with God, all things are possible. Which means, so when he comes and tries to tell you it's not possible, yeah, in and of myself, but I'm not doing it by myself. God is in this. In no way God can do I, I, I'm not in it by myself. God is doing it. God is in it. So I know it's when people come up to you and say, why you keep believing? It ain't happened yet. It ain't about whether it happened yet or not. Because God is in it. All things are what? Possible. All right, really quickly, last verse. Let's go over to Luke chapter number 10. And we're going to end tonight on verse number 19. Actually, let's go on to verse 18. We read this a few weeks ago. Actually, over a month ago, but we're going to read verse 18 again. Luke chapter number 10, and we're going to read verse 18 to 19. Luke chapter number 10, verse 18 to 19. Luke chapter 10, 18 to 19. And he said to them, he being Jesus, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I being God, the Son, give you, how does he give us this authority? Through his blood. I give you the authority to do what, Miss Janice? To trample on serpents and scorpions and over what? Let's read it together. All the power of the enemy. Stop, hard stop, don't go nowhere. Remember when we started part three, I told you that Satan has no weapons that can defeat you because the blood of Jesus has already made him a defeated foe, right? Y'all remember me telling you that? Well, here is the proof. Christ himself says, I give you disciples, and through the blood of Jesus, now extended to us, authority to trample over serpents and over scorpions. And notice that you ought to underline it in your Bible so that you never miss it. What is the authority that I have? What authority do I have over Satan? What authority do I have over the kingdom of darkness? Jesus gives it right here. Satan has no authority over you and I who've been purchased with the blood of Jesus. We have, through the blood of Jesus, authority over him. That's why as believers, we can walk with wisdom in the middle of a, a bad neighborhood and preach and teach the gospel of Jesus. Why? Because we have authority. 
That's why we can walk into the prison cells and preach and teach the Bible and the good news of Jesus. Why? Because we have authority. That's why we can speak over illness and disease and addiction and cause those demons to flee. Why? Because we have authority. Jesus says, I give you the authority to tramp all over serpents and scorpions. And notice this, underline this in your Bible. And over, not some, but all. It's absolute. All the power of the enemy. That's Satan. Y'all see that? Shaquanda, why is that significant? Why is that significant? Somebody in the chat, put it in the chat. Why is that significant? Yeah, I'm asking. I'm not being rhetorical. I'm asking. Why is that significant? Okay, Shaquana says, so that we know no matter what we're going through, we have the power to go through it. Yes, but make it, break it down. Make it even more gritty. Make it, make it even more authoritative. Make it even more, uh. Why are we hearing this? What does it mean? What, is, what does it mean? <laughs> Let's make it straight. Turn the hat on backwards. What does it mean? What does it mean? I give, behold, I give you the authority to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. What, is, what, is, what, is he, what does he mean? What is he saying? Come on, give it to me. Give it to me, ODH. What is he saying? What is he saying? What does it mean? Okay, nothing will hurt us. Stay focused on what God calls you to do because nothing will hurt us. Okay, Irvy, who's that in the chat? You just said something. Irvy said, ain't nobody going to stop us. Okay, we're getting there a little bit more, getting a little bit more. Ugh. Okay, Ms. Janice, anybody? All right, I'm going to put it to you like this. Behold, I give you authority to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. What he's saying is, listen, you ain't got nothing to fear. You got authority over him. You have nothing to fear. When he would come at you, come at him. Y'all missed that. When he would come and try to attack you, remember who you are. When Satan comes and tries to speak darkness over your house, Begin to stomp on his head. When Satan will come and try to speak ill against your body, begin to stomp on his head. When Satan will come and try to bring death over your business, stomp on his head. When Satan will come and try to bring death over your mind, stomp on his head. Why? Because whatever power that he had, he no longer has. My blood. Uh, my blood that was shed caused me to give victory over death, hell, and the grave. And because I sit on the right hand of the Father, Jesus says, I came out with all power in my hands. And the authority that I have, I give to you. So when Satan shows up, stop acting like you got something to fear. When he shows up and tries to Call your bluff, call. Not in and of yourself, but with the word of God. When he comes and tries to act hard, do like Irving said, I ain't got nothing to be scared of. You got to sit there like Michael Jackson in the, in the bad music video, right? When Wesley Snipes was pressing him. You got to sit there, you got to show off. Not in and of yourself, but in the word of God. What am I afraid Satan's coming wanting me to fear him when in reality he's afraid of you and me. Why? Because Jesus says, I have power over him. Not just some power, but all the, all the power of the enemy. That means there is nothing that he can do that you don't have authority over. 
Y'all see that? There is nothing that he can do that you don't already have authority over. There is no attack, no struggle, no circumstance that comes your way that you don't already have the victory over. And when you have that understanding, you can be like Job. And though afflicted, yet will I trust you. When you have that understanding, you can be like Jesus, nailed to a cross, but still trusting in the name above every name. You can still trust in Abba Father. Why? Because you know this is just a momentary affliction. This is just a momentary circumstance. But eyes have not seen it, nor ears have ever heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men, the great things. You got to write down your book, The Great Things. Yeah, I, I know I'm dealing with something right now, but there's some great things that are coming. And whenever I'm afflicted with, tempted with, attacked with, Jesus says, I've got power over every tool, power, trick, weapon of the enemy. So there's nothing that he can do that we don't already have the victory over. So when he comes, you can roll over in your bed and go to sleep and laugh. That's where I'm trying to get you to. That's where I'm trying to get you. I'm trying to get you to that place where when he comes, you don't tremble in fear. You can, huh, I'm going back to sleep because I know I already got the victory. Y'all see that? All right, we're going to close here tonight. I want you on your own to read these scriptures. Definitely going to try to finish next week. So come reading, having prepared and read on your own because I'm going to blast through them. Write down John chapter 8, verse 32. John chapter 8, verse 32. John chapter 8, verse 32. Write down John chapter 16. Verse 33, John chapter 16, verse number 33, John 16, verse 33, John chapter 8, verse 32, write down James chapter 4, verse number 7, James chapter 4, verse number 7, James chapter 4, verse number 7, write down 1 Peter Chapter 5, verse 8 through 9. First Peter, chapter 5, verse 8 through 9. Write down 1 John, chapter 3, verse 8. 1 John, chapter 3, verse 8. 1 John, chapter 4, verse number 4. 1 John 4, verse 4. Write down 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 4 through 5, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 4 through 5, write down Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 37, Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 37, Write down Romans uh, chapter 12, verse number 2, and verse number 21. Romans chapter 12, verse number 2, and verse number 21. Almost there. Write down 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Verse number 3 uh, through 13. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 3 through 13. Write down 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse number 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 6. And verse 16 through 18. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 
verse number six, and then verse number 16 through 18. Three more. Second Thessalonians, chapter three, verse three. Second Thessalonians, chapter three, verse three. First Timothy, chapter six, verse 12. First Timothy, chapter six, verse 12. And lastly, Revelations chapter 12, verse number 11. And that was Irby, 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. Revelations 12, verse 11. We're going to go through those on next week, and that will conclude our This Means War series. Amen? If all hearts and minds are clear, if there are no questions, comments, concerns, colloquies, conundrums, none in the chat, none in the house, if there are no concerns, no questions, we're going to look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this Bible study. God, we thank you that we are every week becoming stronger and stronger. Now, God, it is our prayer as we begin to leave this place, that you go before us, make the way clear and straight, as you stand with us, as you promise to never leave us or forsake us. Bless our going out and our coming in. Keep us, God, until we can meet again, whether it be on Saturday for our walk or Sunday morning. God, it is our prayer that you continue to cover us, protect us from all the wiles of the enemy, but to continue to remind us also of everything that we've learned, that Satan is a powerless foe, that we have been equipped and charged with the word to be able to stand up and rebuff every attack of the enemy. Continue, God, to show us up, gird us up, lift us up on every leaning side. Do for us what we can do for ourselves. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Come on, let's say amen and amen. God bless you, Zion. I love you. But God loves you more. Remember, this is the church where Christ is head. For those of you now e-campuses, e we'll see you next time right here in the kingdom. God bless you all.